to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And in John chapter 12, verse 41, a quotation is made from Isaiah, and there it is made clear in John 12 that Jesus is the one on that throne. And friends, he is the Holy One, the Holy One of God. I don't know about you, but I find it very difficult for my finite mind to even begin to grasp the words that we just interacted with. He's holy. The word itself simply means set apart, sacred, separated. And friends, it's much more than moral purity. I think we have limited the understanding of the holiness of God. God is set apart from all else. He is separated from all else. He is unique. He is holy. God is so holy that he will not tolerate sin. God is so holy that he must judge sin in hell, which is eternal separation from God and eternal fire. But God is so holy that he loves the unlovely. And friends, God is so holy that he himself in the person of a son came and died for your sins and mine. He is a holy God. And it says here, as he which hath called you is holy. The standard for holiness is the holiness of God. Today, people argue about standards. I find that rather humorous in some sense because everyone has standards. And even the person that says he doesn't have any standards, that is a standard. And I'm not sure that this arguing makes a whole lot of sense when you begin to realize that the standard is the holiness of God. And based on that standard, we have a command. As he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy. It's an imperative. Friends, it's a command. And, of course, the quotation is given in verse 16 from Leviticus. When you go back to Leviticus... As it is here in verse 16, it's in the first person. Where in verse 15, we read it in the third person. But you go back to Leviticus and five times God himself in the first person commands his people to be holy. Friends, holiness is not man's idea. It is God's idea. God commands his people to be holy, to be set apart. Now, apartness means that it's not sameness. Pretty simple, rather profound, maybe. Not the same. And friends, when you begin to understand this apartness, this separation, it is beautifully positive, though every positive demands a negative. It is a separation to God from sin. Now, a marriage is an illustration of this. As the bride and the groom come together, they separate themselves to each other from everyone else. You know, last time I checked, that's positive. And it's so positive, you don't even think about the negative. Now, the reality is, we are involved in separation one way or the other. There is no neutral ground. Isaiah 59, 2 says, Your iniquities have separated ah, between you and your God. So you and I are always involved in separation. You're either separated to God from the world and from sin, or you're separated to the world and sin from God. Which separation do we want? As he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy. Oh, hear the call to holiness. Hear it tonight, friend. 
Let the Spirit of God speak it deep within the recesses of your spirit, bearing witness down deep in your innermost being. Hear the call to holiness. As he, as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy. Secondly tonight, notice the plan of holiness. This is amazing. As he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all, key word, manner of conversation. Which, as you may know, means conduct, way of life, behavior, lifestyle. Now, friends, God explicitly in his inspired writ is telling us how this holiness must be applied. Here's the plan. As he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all, all, all manner of lifestyle. Now, let's contrast for a few minutes tonight God's perspective with man's perspective. What a contrast. God's perspective, let's start there, in all, all manner of conversation, of lifestyle. That means holiness of heart and holiness of life. Holiness inwardly and holiness outwardly, all manner of lifestyle, all of it. That's God's perspective. Holiness of heart, to where it has to start. A humble heart, not a proud heart. A humble heart, not the proud look which is an abomination to the Lord. A humble heart. For me personally, in the last last number of weeks, it is that point of truth that has been resounding. From God to this soul, a humble heart. Is he a forgiving heart, not a bitter heart? A resting heart, not a worried, fretful heart. A heart that rejoices when God blesses others rather than is jealous. A heart that esteems others better than themselves not condescends. See, that's a holy heart. An unholy heart esteems ourselves better than others. And friend, honestly, you can you can put on a form of godliness, and there is a form. But you can put on that form, but if in your heart you esteem yourself better then everyone else who doesn't have the form you have and you condescend them, I tell you, that is unholiness. Because a holy heart is the heart of Jesus. The holiness in heart. But it's also holiness of life. Friends, it says all manner of conversation, and there's no way around it. You can check the word out. It's the idea of conduct. It's the idea of way of life, behavior, lifestyle. You cannot say this is just the heart. It's the heart and the life. It's the whole package of inward and outward. Life, lifestyle. And you can see it right here in the context. Look at verse 14, as obedient children, not fashioning. There's a key word, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. There's no way around the reality that this text is saying this holiness is applied not only in heart, but also in life. It is the whole package. That affects issues of media, and that's massive. It affects issues of music, and that's also massive. It affects issues of fashion, and all the facets of it, of modesty and gender distinction. It affects male-female relationships. 
lifestyle. 